Welcome. We're going to continue in the direction we've been studying. What about now? What are some of the benefits of knowing God in your life now? We've talked about how he's given so many blessings in the past, all the things he's done to provide our salvation. And in the future, he's gone to prepare a place for us. And we're looking forward to the time that we'll be with him then. What about now? What about walking with God now? And this in particular, we're talking about the care and maintenance in a forgiven life. Last week, we talked about the forgiveness of God and how complete and forgiving God is and how much he wants to get rid of sin and guilt and cause us not to have to live in it. It's uh, a fantastic thing. But we're going to talk about the preventive maintenance system that he set up for our spiritual living. So let's ask the word of prayer and then we'll dig in. Thank you, Lord, for this, your good word. I have to tell you that there's an awful lot of our day-to-day -day living that is a challenge. And we need from you the direction and care that will cause us to rightfully and uh, and fully live for or walk with you and, and listen to what you'd have to say. Show us, Lord. This is supposed to be a life in which we tap into and use the Holy Spirit who you've given to us to lead, direct, and guide. Show us what it means to be crucified with Christ and yet live on through the power of the Spirit. We praise you, guide us, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, let's dig in. you recall we have the truth of our standing in Christ. Hebrews 10, 10 says, by this will, it means by God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the holy of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then verse 14 says, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. It tells you if you're Christ, you are sanctified. Then it says that he's perfected. He has taken care of the sin issue. He has purified and cleansed you if you are his. So we ought to be able to coast all the way home on that, right? Shouldn't that be a thing where from here on it's smooth sailing? Well, then just like a snake falling out of a tree, we find an old habit. We find a temptation we didn't expect. Someone does something that triggers us and, and we blow up or any number of things. We find ourselves hip deep in the muck that we thought we were free of. How does one who has been forgiven and sanctified, care for and maintain their walk with God. I'm glad you asked that. That's what we're going to look at. In God's word, besides being told that a person who's placed faith in and trust in Jesus Christ for his salvation, being forgiven, sanctified, purified, adopted into God's own family, wonderful good news, the word always is very clear as well that while we live on earth, it's going to include a struggle to maintain a faithful walk with God. Much of what you read through the New Testament are, uh, are writings that help correct error in people's beliefs or in what people are doing. First Corinthians has several things that says, you guys are doing this, you got no business doing that. And you read through it and you realize, well, they struggled. In Galatians 5, you could title this, between freedom and frustration, balancing the good news with the gritty reality. That would be a good way to call it. Galatians 5.1 begins, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. What a beautiful statement. It's for freedom. He freed us to be free. And it's a wonderful thing, but there's no period there. It's only the first part of the sentence. The second part of the sentence says there's a caution for us then not to return to the slavery from which we've been set free. Now, we're going to look at the Old Testament a little bit, and we're going to look at the children of Israel because it's very, very interesting, their perspective and what they went through. So if we read in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, it says this. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel still groaned under the yoke of slavery, and they cried out, and their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel and took notice of them, and thus began the great exodus out of slavery, where the people were set free from bondage. Exodus 12, verse 51. 
And on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts or by their divisions, by their groupings. And in 13 and verse 13 of Exodus, Moses said to the people, remember this day on which you left Egypt, the abode of slavery, because Yahweh, by the strength of his hand, has brought you out of this place. And it was a wonderful thing. Remember this, he says. Be excited. This is a place. But the way was not trouble-free. It wasn't all smooth sailing and easy going. And soon we begin to read some other things. Chapter 14 of Exodus, verses 11 and 12. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us to, out to die in the desert? Why have you done this to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you in Egypt to let us alone? We'd just go on being slaves to the Egyptians? That's a little off from when they were all excited about getting free, wasn't it? Or Exodus 16, verse 2 and 3. There in the desert, the whole community of people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The people of Israel said to him, We wish Yahweh had used his own hand to kill us off in Egypt. There we used to sit around the pots with meat boiling. We had as much as we wanted. But you've taken us out into this desert to let the whole assembly starve to death. <laughs> Sounds like they're a little doubtful about God's good care. Or in Exodus chapter 32. The first four verses says, <clears throat> Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Aaron said to him, Tear off the gold earrings that are on your, the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold earrings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Look how quickly they were willing to turn completely away from God who had actually done the delivering. And as you go ahead, go to Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers 11, 4 through 6, the, it says, The rabble who were among them had greedy desires. When it talks about this rabble, there was a group of people that were Egyptian and foreigners from other places who were not Hebrews, but they followed the Jews out. They saw how their God did stuff. They said, we're going with you. But when it came down to the tough and dirty times, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and melons and leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to eat except this manna. There's nothing to look at except this manna, it says. And then you go ahead to chapter 14 in verses 1 through 4. They had tried to go into the promised land without God going before, without God taking them in. And they got their themselves in trouble. Verse, two, verse 1 of chapter 14 in Numbers says, Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to him, Would that we died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to each other, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. They were willing to go back into the slavery they'd been groaning and calling on God to deliver them from. If we go back to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, again, it's declared there that Messiah Jesus has set us free so that we could be free. But then it cautions us to avoid getting caught into slavery again. Why do you need to be warned about that? Wouldn't you think that slavery? No, you're not going there. But we have to beware of a slave mentality. Pay attention to that. We've got to be aware of a slave mentality. It can Our slave mentality, the way we are trained to think, can look back, can start recalling all the allures of the old life, all of the things that used to be fun. 
that used to be, we used to think were exactly what we're after. And we forget about our groaning under it. We forget about the lashes that hurt, about the chains that bound us, about the feeling of being bogged down and not able to get free. Those things fade away. We look back and say, oh, remember how good that was. Well, this is a reason in Romans 12 and verse 2, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says, don't be conformed. Don't be fitted to this world the way that you used to think, the way that things used to look right, but be changed, remade, transformed by the renewal of your mind, a new way of thinking. You have new ideas, new attitudes. New view on life, so that you may prove, so you can test and discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect in God's sight. Eyes, complete. <laughs> I ran out of word. In God's sight for you, the will of God. Then in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, we're reminded that it is for freedom again. Galatians 5 and verse 13 says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. It is very easy for us to take something, and because we've been set free from what used to bind us, now use our new opportunity to say, Oh man, I can do some fun stuff with this, and decide we're just going to use it now to gratify ourselves and live after our old fleshly desires and and." Who cares? It was God that says free. We're free. Now I'm going. Now I'm running. We're not above using that freedom selfishly to gratify some want that we have. And then when you get down into verses 14 to 17, you realize there's a war going on. It says, for the whole law fulfilled in, is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. This is telling us that there's a work going on. Don't go feral. Don't go running off wild. We used to have a little cat. We we had a cat named Paxack, and she had babies, and she... Uh, we gave her away to my sister and an owl later, but a kitten was left, and this little kitten didn't know people. It was wild. She was an outdoor cat, so this little kitten, I had to crawl under a shed to get her. It was winter time, and we wanted to bring her, and I put on my heaviest gloves, and I went out there to get that cat, and I was going to grab her, and when I did, she grabbed and bit into my gloves. If I hadn't had those thick gloves on, she'd have bit to the bone. And I brought her in. She didn't know that I wanted the best for her. She was thinking that somehow I was attacking and going to kill and eat her, I guess. Sometimes we can be feral like that. We can think the old way. We cannot be aware of the, the God who wants to take us into the fullness of what our life's supposed to be. And so we fight with him. And when we set it up so that we're going by a set of rules, laws, the Lord said, that never worked before, and it's not going to work now. You need to be led by the Spirit of God in a living relationship, not just have more rules written down. You don't need to switch one set of laws for another set of laws and think you're going to have it made. You can't do it in your own flesh. Therefore, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You go on in verse 18. Uh, it says, it, but if you're led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. It means you're not living by rules. You're living in relationship. You're living in by the prompting of God's Spirit. And then in verses 19 to 23 in Galatians 5, Paul says, look, here are the symptoms to watch for. Verse 19. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, and he goes listing them out. He says, if you see these things, something's wrong. When you go to the doctor, the doctor looks you over and he checks out, well, what are your symptoms? Well, I've got a fever and I got chills and my throat's sore and my nose is plugged up and I can't hear very well. And you go through all this list of stuff and he tells you, oh, well, we'll have to deal with all that. Same way, Paul says, the deeds of the flesh are these, immorality, impurity, sensuality, living 
so that sex is in front all the time. It's always your body, always your cravings that drive you. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. It goes right on down and many more. It says, these are the fruit of the flesh. If you see these symptoms, it means something's wrong. It means you're not listening to them, being led by the Spirit. But after it tells you those fruits, those produce of the fleshly life, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or endurance, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against these things, there's no law. He said it, it isn't the law thing at all. These things are the natural outcome of being led by the Spirit. It says, here's what you'll see if, in fact, you're abiding in and walking with Christ. Now, John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus was dealing with this issue, staying united with him. Listen to what it says. This is, it says, John 15, 4 and 5 says, Jesus saying, stay united with me as I will with you. For just as a branch can't put forth fruit by itself apart from the vine, so you can't bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit because apart from me, you can't do a thing. <laughs> and it's just as literal as that. If you're not hooked into the vine, you don't get the nurturing and the nourishment that causes you to be able to bear good fruit. So Paul doesn't say it's easy to stay where we're supposed to be. He never does <laughs> make it out like, oh, sure, you got it covered. If you look, for example, in Romans chapter 7 and 8, he talks about the problem with strict law keeping. Romans chapter 7, in, and starting with verse 14, he goes through and he begins to tell you, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand, for I am not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. He says, it is a struggle. It is something in which it, it, there's a fight going on. It's inside us. We're trying to keep what the law says is good. And he says, and I keep finding out that I really want to, but something inside me drives me to not do that, to not live the way that God said it had to be done. So Paul points out, it's right in front of us. God's instructions show what's good, and I really want to do it. But inside me is this old nature, this natural self. Verse 18, as a matter of fact, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. He said, in my head, I want to do it. When it comes to actually keeping at it, keeping doing what's right, I can't do it. What God says is right and good, he says, and we agree with that. But inside me, there's a sin nature that fights for my own way and battles to keep control and hates the idea of someone else telling me what I ought to do and what I shouldn't do. What can we do? Verses 24 and 25. And this is from the, the, the paraphrase called the message. And listen to what it says. <clears throat> is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acts to set things right in this life of contradictions, where I want to serve God with all my heart and all my mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. And then you get into chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and here's a fact. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation has been taken out on Christ on the cross. And as a matter of fact, we're not condemned because we struggle. The Lord doesn't ever look at you and say, oh, you're struggling. Well, that shows you're a loser. That's not how God looks at it. And yet that's how we kick ourselves all around the room sometimes. All condemnation has been heaped on Christ on the cross. He took that. That is a fact. And what that does is that frees us up from needing to justify ourselves by our performance at law keeping. We don't have to try and justify. We can trade out that 
walk of trying to live by the law for the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. You look at uh, verses 2 through 4 here, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's not a matter of just gritting your teeth and trying harder. It's a surrender of yourself to God, the Spirit, who lives inside you if you're born again. Well, did this ensure that you never blow it? You never have, have a problem again? Got it all worked out now? Finally, figured it out. Live by the Spirit and don't have to do anything wrong. Well, maintenance helps, but there are times when you're going to need repairs. Look at 1 John chapter 1. This is one of the great places in the Word of God. We're going to read verses 5 through 10. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Listen to what it says. This is a message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Understand, there's no compromise with God. He did not lower his justice. He did not lower his standard. He did not say, well, they're pretty grubby, but I'm going to go ahead and let them in. He said, I'm going to do a complete cleanup. It's an absolute, total, complete cleanup to make them fit to be in my own family, and I'm going to bring them in. There is no darkness in him. He's all light. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and aren't telling the truth. We aren't practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The cleansing is a flowing, ongoing thing. It's something that comes from walking in his light. We have fellowship with each other. It causes us to get along as we both are submitting to and listening to the Spirit's leading, but it causes us to get along with God and to be in a constantly renewing, cleansing. He knows we struggle. He knows that there's a battle going on, and he's given us this to walk in his light so that the cleansing keeps on. Now, in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. If we say, oh, there's no sin, there's nothing that needs to keep being cleansed, there's not a problem. Well, we're still stuck in a body that houses a sin nature. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just or righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. So it's not a dishonesty in which we ignore what we've done wrong, ignore things that would pull us away, ignore the fact that there's a struggle, and say, no, 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 there's no sin here. We're doing, doing good. But instead, and look at how this is set up, and I want you to look close at verses 8, 9, and 10. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word's not in us. He said, the sin problem's there. But nestled right in the middle of those two verses, right in the heart of it is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just or righteous. He doesn't lower his standard. He is faithful to lift up to his standard of righteousness, not say, well, we'll just ignore that or, or we'll take it. He says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nestled right in the middle of making sure we understand Yes, sin is an issue. Yes, that it will keep rearing its ugly head. And in the middle of that, he says, ah, but if you confess, I'll be the cleanser. I'll take care of you. There's a story in John 13, 6 through 10. They're at the Last Supper where the Lord Jesus is going to celebrate and initiate the communion service, the bread and the wine that, that he gave as a memorial of his death. But he also did something else. Verse 5 of chapter 13 of John says, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel in, with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, You don't know what I'm doing now. 
You don't realize what's going on, but you will understand hereafter. So Peter said to him, never are you going to wash my feet. You see, Jesus was the Lord, the boss, the master. For him to stoop to doing the lowest menial slave's job, Peter was mortified at that. Jesus said, so Peter said to Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, well, then Lord, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You're clean, but not all of you, because he knew that there were, Judas was having an issue and this was going to come out later. But what he was telling Peter is, once you've come to God for cleansing, yes, you're going to get your feet dirty. There are going to be times when you're touched by the sin that's in the world that we're still a part of. Your old nature is going to rear up. There's going to be times when you're tired and crabby and when, you, when you're weak and the, the devil attacks when you're the weakest. And these things will come. But you've already been cleansed, but there'll be times when you need to wash your feet. When someone used to take in the public Roman baths, wash up, and then walk home in sandals. By the time they got home, their feet were dusty again. But they were still clean. They'd been to the bath, so they would wash their feet. Now they're all clean again. And this is the picture that he was saying. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not denying that there is sin, not saying we'll never be touched by it again, but saying that there's a constant cleansing, a flowing of the water of cleansing that comes from God that through the blood of Christ washes and purifies and keeps us clean. We have to come back to get our feet washed. All right. I'm going to give you a summary. Here's what we've been talking about. And here's what we've been saying. First of all, know that you are not condemned. Romans 8, 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's important for you to know. The condemnation is God. God isn't always after you condemning for what you've done and what you're doing. Secondly, use the correct power supply. If I used to be in the Navy and we had a preventive maintenance system that we used to use and and one of the things we check is is this machine getting enough power and so you use the correct power supply Galatians 5 16 walk by the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh the spirit is your power supply number three perform regular diagnostic checks Galatians 5 19 to 25 says the fruit of the flesh are these things, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And so do regular diagnostic checks. What's coming out of you? What things are coming forth? Are you suffering from jealousies and anger and outbursts and spite and bitterness that you have in there? You know, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. The love, joy, peace. And, and, and endurance, these come from the Holy Spirit. So do regular maintenance checks. And then number four, repair instructions are included. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. There's a repair manual that is used for bringing us back into right relationship and cleansing and the purities that he's called us to. This is the maintenance and care instructions for the forgiven life. Nobody's ever going to tell you that you believe in Jesus and from there on you never have a problem. What we are going to tell you is God's given the system by which we overcome and can live righteously and sin-free because we are bringing the sin, bringing the struggle, bringing the life to him and opening up and saying, it's not I, it's Christ. It's not me putting forth the effort. It's Christ living through me. I will submit to the Lord. I will give myself to him. I will allow him to be the boss and leader in my life. You sit on the throne, Lord. Let me follow where you lead. This is, this is your life in Christ. You want to be successful? That's where it comes from. Let's have prayer. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this. You are so practical about what you gave us in the Word. You are so 
honest about the fact that you understand what we're made of and you understand the struggles that we have and you understand that at times we're going to be trying to do it on our own and we're going to fall flat in our faces. And yet you made an established relationship in which we could continue to come to you and you would continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This, Lord, is fantastic. And there'll come a day we're going to step into the presence of God where one day there will no longer be that struggle against sin. We won't have to worry about it. We'll be freed from it in that time. But in the meantime, show us how to walk with you, sensitive to you, listening to you, letting you be the Lord and the leader in our lives. These things we bring to you, we ask you by your grace to open us up to that truth and lead us in that way. Thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Keep on. It's well worthwhile. Go with God. Seek God with all your heart. Don't stop now. We're not done yet. Keep going till we've crossed the finish line. And then we're going to find out what the prize was for sticking with him. It's good. It's well worth it. Don't give up now. We'll see you next time.